Hello, and welcome to an exciting journey through the eyes of Marvin and Bernard Kalb, two of the most respected broadcast journalists of our time. Over a period of 70 years, these two brothers reported some of the world's most historic events and witnessed firsthand some of our nation's most turbulent moments. Marvin Kalb was a diplomatic correspondent for CBS and NBC News for 30 years. In the 1980s, he anchored Meet the Press. He also anchored the Kalb Report, a quarterly broadcast from the National Press Club, emphasizing journalistic ethics and practice. He has authored and co-authored 14 books, including his most recent, The Road to War, Presidential Commitments Honored and Betrayed. Today, Marvin Kalb is a senior advisor to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is a professor of journalism at Harvard University. Bernard Kalb started as a reporter and columnist for the New York Times before he branched out into TV journalism at CBS and NBC News. He was a foreign correspondent for 15 years covering Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Bernard Kalb's career as a journalist took him to locations around the world including Washington, Moscow, Beijing, Saigon, Paris, Antarctica, and many places in between. These two brothers have some wonderful stories to tell that will be both entertaining and educational. So sit back and prepare to take a journalistic journey as the Johns Hopkins Osher School of Lifelong Learning and Montgomery College's TV and radio students proudly present the Brothers Cal here, there, and everywhere, a lecture series that recounts the globe-trotting professional experiences of Marvin and Bernard Kalb. CBS News diplomatic correspondent Marvin Kalb. This is Mao Zedong, undisputed master the of communist China. Hit by Agreement Jewels. reduces the risk of war. Do you agree or disagree? Probably be for the last time. Marvin Cal, CBS News. I'll tell you what we're going to do today. Marvin and I held a summit meeting and wondered what we could do to keep the troops interested in what we've been talking about. And we discovered that between us, we have about 100 years of journalism. And probably almost every country in the world that we bounce in either on our own or traveling with Kissinger or traveling with a president. And we thought it might be interesting if we could dig through the rogues gallery of people we've met and talk about people we've met along the way. Kings, murderers, <laughs> tyrants, uh, coup plotters. We've met them all in one country or another over 100 years of journalism. And so Marvin has poked around in his memory and come up with a few people in a few centuries. And I had done the same thing. And what we hope to do today is resurrect, resuscitate two or five or ten, however the time goes, and whatever we can recollect, given our condition, uh, whatever we can recollect in terms of sharing with you uh, the people we met, the, the hobbies we met, the discoveries we made along the way in countries all over the world. I mean, inevitably, I will get to Vietnam. Inevitably, Marvin had a full collision with the Soviet Union in his Soviet Union days. Yeah. But that's the general theme. And after we're through, you can ask some questions. Did we be so and so along the way? And the answer will be inevitably no. <laughs> but let's try Marvin doing an ev evocation of what exactly Marvin, what period? I want to start in the 1950s in Moscow. Will that work? <coughs> Hello? <laughs> Are you here? <laughs> uh, okay, now. When I first got to Moscow, it was late January 1956. Stalin had been dead for two and a half years. And you have to remember, or try to remember, what it might have been like uh, to live in that kind of society when Stalin was the boss. It was an extremely oppressive society. Two o'clock in the morning, you might get a knock on the door and be whisked off 
by the secret police for doing something that you never really did, but they'll accuse you of something. There was fear. There were shortages. It was a terrible place. And when I got there in January of 56, mm -hmm. that mood was still very, very much with the people. It was still a dark place. And it was 42 degrees below zero when I got off uh, the train which had come in from Helsinki. And I was greeted there by an American embassy person. And I was ready to walk back onto the train, but he grabbed me. But he said, no, 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 it, you get used to it after a while. <laughs> and the following day, actually, the temperature did rise to 38 below zero. And that was considered a, a you know, a heat spell. Um, but I tell you, the first day that I was in Moscow, to give you a sense, I walked out of the embassy building determined that I was going to see Red Square, because after all, you're in Moscow, you should see Red Square. And I noticed a guy following me within a matter of a, a minute. And he was a young man, I remember, with a very dark um, Russian-style hat. And um, I thought I could get away from him, so I ducked into the metro, and he ducked in with me. And we got to Red Square, he came to Red Square. I went into the Boom Department store, which was very busy, and I thought I could shake him, but he was right there at all times. And in Russia, no matter what the temperature is, they eat ice cream. And I like people who eat ice cream. I think that's a sign of a good kind of person. And so I stood in front of the counter, and I said, give me two vanilla ice cream. And I went this way without looking back. And he took it. And immediately began to eat, and I felt that I could get along with Russia after that. Um, and we've already talked a couple of weeks ago about the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was 62. What I want to talk about for a moment here now has to do with, again, that personality of Nikita Khrushchev. When Khrushchev took over, the first thing he did in February of 1956 was to denounce Stalin. There was the very famous de-Stalinization speech. It was an extraordinary speech. It was to say that everything we have all lived through in the last 30 years was a lie. It was a lie. And we have to find an entirely new way of running ourselves. It was a big deal. It was a big Marvin, deal. I thought he was going to say, and we have to find an entirely new way to lie. <laughs> well, they did a lot of that, too. <laughs> they did a lot of that, too. But they were seeking at that time in a very serious way because <clears throat> Khrushchev recognized immediately that communism wasn't working. Now, anyone with half a brain could have seen that almost immediately. But Khrushchev was a dedicated communist, believing that through communism they would arrive at some glorious paradise, and everything would be marvelous for everybody. It simply wasn't true. It was an extremely unhappy, deprived society. And I would even go further and to say to this day, with the exception of Moscow and St. Petersburg, Russia remains an underdeveloped country. It is a backward country. And most of the Russian people understand that, and that's why there's such an eagerness to reach out uh, to the West when they can. Imagine 1959, Khrushchev still eager to sell his optimistic vision of communism, um, invites Vice President Richard Nixon to visit Moscow, and the United States is host to an international exhibition for economic and technological advance. You could ask the question immediately, since Russia was so far behind, why in God's name would they bring in the very best of the United States so that the Russian people could see it? Khrushchev was gambling. He gambled during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was a much less um, frightening kind of gamble. He thought that if you could show the best of America and argue that we're going to not only get there, but beat them, there's a Russian word, the Russian word ganyat, and then pity ganyat. And ganyat means we're going to catch up. 
Pinagan yet was the way Khrushchev said, we'll catch up and then go way beyond that. And that's what he was trying to sell the Russian people. So Nixon, no fool at all, very smart in the way in which he dealt with communist leaders. You all remember the kitchen cabinet, or some of you may remember the kitchen debate that took place in 1959 between Nixon and Khrushchev. Khrushchev at that point was trying to sell Nixon and through television the world that really Russia had everything that was good. The point is Khrushchev was trying to sell the whole world on the idea that Russia really was the better country and that they could catch up with and overtake the United States and it would all be done in a period of just a few years. So in effect, Russian people, hang on and it's going to happen. Just hang on. And Nixon was saying right back to him, if it becomes a matter of your grandchildren, see Khrushchev had said that my grandchildren are going to live in a society infinitely better than yours. And Nixon snapped very quickly and he said, no, my grandchildren will continue to live in America and my grandchildren will live in a society infinitely better than anything you can produce. Khrushchev lost that debate, such as it was, and they went in then to the kitchen, which this is not the right picture. They went into a small, make-believe American kitchen. And it was so incredibly stupid on reflection that Khrushchev would allow this to happen. But somebody like Bill Sapphire, who became a great New York Times columnist, at that time was working for a PR firm that set up the kitchen. And he wanted very much to sell the idea of the kitchen. He didn't care very much about the debate itself, these two leaders having a discussion. And they, the two leaders went back and forth on who's better, but that's not terribly important. Sapphire takes his camera and throws it to an AP reporter standing outside the small kitchen and took a picture of the two of them in their argument. And that picture it was what was projected all over the world. And that picture suggested a kind of equality, a kind of coexistence. In the, we're going to talk next week about journalism and what's happened to it. But you could see it even then in 59. If you have a picture of two leaders standing together and they're having an argument, you don't really listen to what they're saying. You watch what they're doing. And when you watch what they're doing, you see a kind of artificial equality between the two. There's one leader standing here, one here. They're having an argument about a kitchen, but who cares about that? And the picture is what is projected. And that picture for Nikita Khrushchev was fabulous. When I knew I was getting the assignment in the Antarctic, I went back to my desk and my friends gathered around me and said, where are they sending you? I said, I said, I'm going to go to the Army-Navy store and pick up some, you know, polar clothing. <laughs> the fellow next to me and laughed. He said, can you once for all forget your upbringing? Louder. Louder. Where am I? Is it here? Yeah. The fellow sitting next to me at the desk, who happened to be the son of the manager, get it. He said, the New York Times does not go to second-hand polar stores. You go to Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> 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 Which I did. <laughs> I went to Abercrombie and Fitch, and I bought a pair of cashmere underwear, <laughs> top and bottom. Yeah. Cashmere underwear, uh, top and bottom. The cost was what? what? What do you think it cost might be in 1955? Oh, God. For the cashmere? Come on, come on. Twenty-five. What's your number? Twenty-five. Twenty-five dollars. Yeah. Two hundred. Sixty. Five bucks. <laughs> the cost was ninety-nine dollars. <laughs> so I took it to the Antarctic. It turned out that the weather never got too cold for me. So I never wore the, the, uh, the I never wore the cashmere. But the word got around that uh, the New York Times guy has cashmere underwear. <laughs> And Bird heard about it. And Bird came over to my ship, my ship, 
to look at the underwear. When I get back, what do you think a well-brought-up kid from New York does? Returns it. Returns it. And then, <laughs> who said returns? You get two weeks in Antarctica. Uh, returns it. But what's the critical question? The, the, the receipt. What? The receipt. Did, Did you wear it? Did you wear it? No, never yeah, ask me that. Come on, what? That, there's another sentence that goes with it. Come and what? Kept the money. Who said something? Had credit. Well, the Times, back the money. Kept the money. Did you get the weird? I gave the money back to the Times. Oh. But, thank you, brother. But Abercrombie and Fitch, sometimes you may see these things, Abercrombie and Fitch put out a list, the membership list of the Adventurers Club. It has people, President Theodore Roosevelt, outfitted 1908 for a shooting trip, Charles Lindbergh, <laughs> AF outfitted 1927 flight across the Atlantic, uh, Duke of Windsor, AF outfitted the Duke of Salmon, Bernard Cow. <laughs> Not making it up. <laughs> Red cashmere underwear. <laughs> On 1955, bird expedition to the South Pole. <laughs> 99 bucks, I got the times of credit. And uh, quite a memory. When I think the farm assignment might have been clean, so Brooklyn. Uh, I wanted to tell you very briefly about an experience I had with President Lyndon Johnson during the Vietnam War. Um, the CBS Bureau, as many of you may know, is at 2020 M Street. And you pass it by, you'll see the CBS logo there. And the correspondents were always on the first floor or the second floor. My office was on the first floor. The studio was on the ground floor. So if you were doing a cut-in for the CBS Evening News with Cronkite, you'd be doing it on the ground floor and then do whatever you want afterward I would walk upstairs to my office, see if there's a phone message or something like that. On this particular night, I had a quite good story about a change in American policy suggesting that we, we were going to be much more aggressive in our bombing campaign against North Vietnam. And I did that piece live into the Cronkite show. When it was over, I picked myself up and walked up to my office, a journey that would take no more than 45 seconds. And when I got uh, to my office, the phone was already ringing. And I'm a bit of a witch, and I sort of had a feeling that there was trouble. And I picked up the phone, and I heard Linda Johnson screaming at the top of his voice, denouncing me in the sharpest way, and the part of it that I remember that cut very deeply was his statement that what I had just broadcast on CBS would end up costing the lives of American airmen and that you will be responsible for this and it will be on your conscience for the rest of your life. And he hung up and I put the phone down and I have to tell you, I remember the experience very well. I was trembling and my hand was shaking when I put the phone down and I sat down and I didn't know what to do and when I went home that night I was I was a wreck. My assignment the following day was at the White House and there was a an area set aside for network cameras and reporters when the president is receiving a foreign visitor and I was looking at him and I thought, out of the corner of his eye, he was kind of glancing over toward me and the CBS crew. And I became more sure of that because as he was escorting his visitor, who I don't remember right now, but he was escorting his visitor, he sort of backed over to where I was standing with the crew and just said quietly, call Walt. Walt was Walt Rostow, who was the National Security Advisor at the White House. And I was thinking to myself, what am I getting into here? 
because I still remember it very clearly, that anger in his voice and that statement about you'll be responsible for the deaths of. I did call Walt Rostow, obviously, and for the first time. I had called him on any number of times and either got no answer or somebody would say he'll call you back but he never called back or sometimes he would call back knowing that the broadcast was already over and there's no harm that I could do with anything that he said. This time he was available immediately and I walked into his office um, it's the same office there now for the National Security Advisor. And there is a desk over here and a big window over here and a large oval table to the right as you walk in. On that table was a huge map of North Vietnam. And the map was stamped all over the place, top secret. And Rosto said, Marvin, you know, very friendly, which is absolute artificial stuff. Come on over here, I want to show you something. We walked over to the map and I saw top secret on it and I said, well, I don't look at top secret stuff. I have to broadcast tonight. I don't look at top secret stuff. He said, oh, it's perfectly all right. The president wanted you to know this. And I said, that's fine. I'm glad. I'm delighted. But I don't look at top secret stuff. So if you want to tell me something, tell me something right here, not at the desk, uh, at the table. Oh, he said, if you want to be so fussy, uh, okay. And he began to tell me about where they were going to begin to hit in North Vietnam. In other words, I had said the night before that they would begin an aggressive campaign. I didn't say they were starting it. <laughs> this time, prompted by the president, they say, this is where it's going to be. So, do you go with the story? And the answer is, I was very nervous about it. And I called, um, I had two very good senator people whom I used to check with. Both of them were on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I checked with one. And I remember him saying, where the hell did you find that out? And I said, put that aside for a second. Is it right? He said, yes, we were briefed on it yesterday. And I said, well, what do you think? Is this something that you should go with? And he said, sounds like a good story to me, and it'll frighten the hell out of those people, and that's what we want to do. So I was being used to frighten them, uh, but it was a very good story. Uh, but I was thinking also about Lyndon Johnson and the sort of man that he was. I think he was genuinely angry the night before, but I also think he was the kind of person who um, didn't want to hurt me, um, really, and on reflection, thought that he wanted to do something nice. And so the following day, he gave me a story. Um, and that is, you know, that is the way a reporter will kind of bump into a story, bump into a leader, even somebody as large and important as Lyndon Johnson. Back to the Antarctic. <laughs> uh, no, we, not bad. Um, <laughs> uh, not, we're not going back to the Antarctic, we're going to China again. <coughs> there was a time back in the 50s and 60s when China didn't want to be mistaken as an ally of the Soviet Union. And when the Russians busted into Czechoslovakia and Hungary, the Chinese Prime Minister, Zhou Enlai, traveled through Southeast Asia to reassure those countries that we Chinese are not like those Russians. And they accused the Chinese, those Russians, of big nation chauvinism. That the Russians sought to push things aside and deal aggressively and with force in executing their strategies and their problems. We Chinese don't do that. And Zhou Enlai, who Kissinger in his memoirs calls the most sophisticated diplomat he met in all his years of travel, Joe and Lai, who died in 1976. Joe and Lai was handpicked as chairman now to go through these countries and, as I say, reassure Malaysia, Bangkok, Thailand, Burma, etc., that we, we will never duplicate what the Russians did in Eastern Europe. 
when, when the Russia, when the Japanese were attacking in, in the coast of East China, uh, Nanking, 1937 and so forth, Joe and his family, Joe was about nine then, fled China and they went to New York. And they lived uh, at 233 East 12th Street because he remembers it in the trip to New York. Who I don't know where I have that particular clip. He went to Harvard for a year, and when the Korean War broke out in 1950, he went to Horace Mann Elementary School. Harvard, got into Harvard, and when the Korean War broke out in 1950, and the Chinese eventually moved in there in the late 50, uh, he was torn between two allegiances, he, Ji Chao Chu, and uh, he decided to go back to China. But in his travels, where I was to meet him, just to backtrack for just a second, Whenever Joe and I traveled, G was with him as the interpreter. I tried endlessly to get to see, to talk with him. You may recall when we talked about China, when the Chinese official saw me, he ran. Because he knew I was going to approach him and ask for an interview or some access of visa to China and so forth. So the Chinese backtracked because there was this huge silence, the shunning of America, by America, of China. And until the freeze ended with the Nixon visit in 71, there was an alienation, calculated alienation on the U.S. part to make sure that nobody has anything to do with China. We lived in Hong Kong then, and we could not go shopping in Chinese communist stores. We used to sneak into the French store once in a while to buy a chachu or something like that, <laughs> but not, not serious purchases. The Chinese didn't let us in either. And there were no visas granted. When I saw this guy traveling, I got to know him facially, and he got to know me facially. One time, we are now in Romania, and Joe and I is taking the elevator up to the top floor of a hotel on the Black Sea. What, anybody been to the Black Sea? I can get it for you in a minute. Uh, the Black Sea. He's up on the top floor. Ceausescu, name strike a bell, remember? No, Ceausescu, very nice guy. Ceausescu, Joe and I, and G, in the rush toward the elevator, was left out. So he got in the next elevator. And when I saw him in the next elevator, I jumped in with him. Gotcha! <laughs> One, two, three. I said, Mr. G, you know, we've been together in uh, Thailand. We've been together in uh, Burma. You know, I traveled even to Albania. We've been in many countries. And I was wondering whether I could. <laughs> and uh, it would be good if we could get an interview with the Prime Minister, Joe and I, so that we can get his thoughts to the American people. J. I. G. wrote the book. Here's the, the book you see it. The Man on Mao's Right. He was the inevitable constant interpreter for Chairman Mao and Prime Minister Zhou Enlai. And if, as I was looking through the last few days on YouTube, he has some horrendous expressions to talk about with respect to Chairman Mao. But yes, he was the founder, and yes, he helped create our country, Chairman Mao. But he was horrible. He uses terrible words because of inflicting the Cultural Revolution, which was a disaster on the Chinese people with millions who perished during that particular period. But G gave what he, when the book came out, he traveled to the United States and like any author, tried to sell books. And he appeared somewhere, I think it was Cleveland, and while he was there, he did an interview with a woman who I didn't know about, but she introduced herself in the passing that she had been the interpreter for some of the American delegations and the fact that they knew each other and they knew each other quite well as competing interpreters for competing presidents. You may recall that when I talked to you last time, I talked to you about a famous handshake that never happened. Anybody remember? Yes. Remember I flashed that picture up of, and told you and told you that in 1954, and G was there in 1954 as the interpreter for Joe and Lai, and there was frigid relations between the U.S. and China, the communists having seized the mainland only five years earlier in 1949. Notwithstanding, Zhou Enlai put out the word to the various delegations at the Paris conference in 1954 <coughs> that he was ready to shake the hand of John Foster Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State. The U.S. Secretary of State said no. It was a snub to remember. A billion people have been instructed in that snub because the snub has great energy built into it from the Chinese nationalist point of view. And I was over once in London and I was there with uh, 
Marshall Coy, who used to own the uh, Madison Hotel. And uh, Marshall had worked out a dinner with Ambassador Chi at some place in London, and I went along on that. And uh, Chi and I reminisced about the, cold, the uh, strategic cold shoulder he had given me for decades when I tried to exchange a word of it to him. And we had a big laugh about the past and the refinements of diplomacy. There was a picture here I wanted to show you that if you have that one in the White House, do you have that? Take a second, but it's worth getting if we can get it. I see it. Yes, no? <coughs> ah, that picture. You remember last time, I meant to show you this last time. You remember last time when I was here, I told you about Wang Chen, the ambassador, Chinese ambassador to Indonesia and Paris, and whenever he would see me approaching, he would run the other way, etc. <laughs> It turned out that in the late uh, 70s, he became the head of the first diplomatic establishment by China in the United States in Washington, Wang Chun. Wang Chun, the same fellow who had snubbed me, was now based in the United States, heading the Chinese liaison office. The day that Nixon resigned, Ford took over, and Ford brought all the ambassadors in one after the other to reassure them that though Nixon was no longer president, the United States was following the same foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis your country, etc. In other words, he was articulating a sense of diplomatic continuity on the part of the United States, despite the fact that there's been an abrupt and sudden change of leadership at the top. So there you have a kiss and make up uh, with China. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Brothers Kalb, here, there, and everywhere. Join us again next time for an up-close and personal view of the unforgettable events that shaped our nation and the world. And remember, you can always join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Mary Kay Shartle Galato, Director of the Osher Program at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.